concrete pastures. Hello family, welcome back to Concrete Pastures. I am Nancy Mulemwasisi. Oh my God, I am so excited to have our guest today. Before I get to her, to anybody who is new, this is a platform, a safe space for you. We highlight our immigrant stories for people, for you guys that have relocated to new countries in search of better opportunities, we also share our stories and lessons learned along the way, offering fresh perspective on the immigrant journey. So whether you're an immigrant, soon or later to be, or just curious, join us and get a better understanding on what it's like to be an immigrant. Please, we are still growing our community. And whenever you subscribe, you're helping us to get amazing guests like our guests today. So share, like, and continue to follow us on all of our platforms. We are everywhere. Any platform, you'll find us there, Concrete Pastures. And uh, make sure you check out our website as well, concretepastures.com. So let's meet our guest. Agosa is a globally experienced leader with a passion for the energy industry. She has lived in multiple countries, including Nigeria, England, Northern Ireland, USA, Malaysia, South Africa, you name it. Agosa has an extensive business travel experience across Africa, Europe, Asia Pacific, and the US of A. She has been recognized as a, a woman to watch in 2021 annual list compiled by Crawford School of Management and has also been featured in the Powerless 2021 Pan-African Female Leaders in the Energy by Africa Oil Week. Egosa is a TEDx speaker and is becoming as an impactful leader shaping the future of the energy industry. She has spoken with CNN about innovation in the energy space, specifically driving access and affordability in Africa. Egosa has been named one of the top 100 most influential women in Africa and was previously included in the list of top 100 women CEOs in Africa. Welcome. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, this is a lot. I didn't even get half of her recipe, guys. Okay. Yeah. She has. When do I see? <laughs> 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 she has an amazing resume of course this is why she's here she's here uh just to inspire us to share some of her inspirational journey and just for us to get a pen and paper and learn from her journey how are you doing i'm very well i'm super excited first of all thank you so much i'm extremely humbled um i almost feel like the time we spent together before pressing the record button should be the podcast and not the podcast until <laughs> I know. It's been great getting to know you getting to connect with you sharing our stories you know and um when i looked into concrete pastures i watched a few episodes i thought wow i would love 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 to to give back because the other stories were very inspiring and you know you just have to be grateful for people who are willing to be open and be vulnerable and share of themselves, yeah. you know, the great parts of their stories, the not so great parts of their stories, because that's how everybody else learns. Yeah. And people aren't willing to put themselves out there, then we don't learn. Yeah. And so this is new for me. I have to be honest. I've always been someone who's happy to remain in the shadows and think, well, why does anyone want to hear my story? What's that going to do to help them? <laughs> And so I am I'm truly humbled and really um appreciative to be on your platform. And I hope I always say if I touch one life, then that's more than enough for me. Yeah. Listen, I'm more than grateful for you being here, making time. It's such an honor. Because right. your story really touched me. And uh, for anybody who's watching and listening to us, um, she shares some of her story as well on TEDx and that's the TEDx actually someone sent to me to, to watch and I was so inspired by her TEDx story and I'm like 
she has to come on concrete pastures i know i'm not the only one who's going to be inspired so guys i'll have the link in the show notes you could click away and there's so much jams in there that you you can take away from um from what she shares aside from what she's going to be sharing today we already started this uh talking behind the scenes okay um <laughs> but for starters for anybody who has not had the behind the scenes story <laughs> um you're originally from uh, nigeria and you've been to a number of countries um just share with us how it was growing up in nigeria just so we can get to know you a little bit before we get into what you do yeah um i love how you say i'm originally from nigeria i am from nigeria oh. um and, and you know I, I say that because for a while i think i was identity lost identity displaced mm. because i and immersed myself in so many different cultures right and so um we'll talk later about this whole concept of people who've lived and thrived in multiple cultures across multiple countries mm -hmm. and find how do you define your identity right yeah and i i actually love that sentence originally because why people always try to find out where you come from so that they can quantify you or they can place you in a box it's a real thing in our society right yeah but at some point are you really only where you come from or are you now a multifaceted outcome of all these places that you've been in and you've lived in and cultures that you've been exposed to um who knows who knows or maybe you remain only the core identity of your root your source who knows again to be discussed but growing up in nigeria was it was a dream it was a dream and there's actually a business case which i wrote many years ago with a professor mm -hmm. which i teach every year and in fact he's publishing a book very similar to you know there's a book called the third culture kids uh, my professor has been doing research for many years about third culture professionals mm. and my, my business case is very similar to, to third culture professionals. And I share that to answer your question, because in this book, what he's exploring is exactly what you're asking me. Um, you know, tell us about where you grew up so that we can start to build this picture of who you are and then layer on top of it, all these places that you've been. And it's so odd. I did not want to leave Nigeria. After 15 years, um, look, you hear people who had nothing else but a desire to move to the U.S. or as children, they dreamed of going to these foreign places. And it's so telling for me because it means I was very satisfied as a child. Now, probably naive because the time in which I left, universities were closed for, for years on end. Um, you know, we started to probably see the first signs of the economy really becoming what it is today with the currency rate and, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, industry and business becoming very challenging. So, but, but as a, as a 15 year old child, my identity was so grounded and so strong that when my parents said, cause my older sister had already moved to the UK for school and my parents said, okay, you finished, um, high school. And actually, I think it was the next day after I finished, without any warning, my mom announced that I was moving to the UK. And I, I, I couldn't grasp it. I couldn't grasp it because here I was, I was head girl of my 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 high school. Living a good life. Pretty much, yeah. I was, you know, I was popular. I was known. <laughs> I was, I was a bit of a geek. Um, you know, very studious. Most years, I would be class president, and we grew up in a very small community where everybody knew your name. They knew you as your mother's daughter, your father's daughter, your older sister's sister. It was you are ex's sister, you are so so and so's, you are Irene's daughter, you are Greg's daughter. Yeah, and your identity was weaved into so many things. And my mom telling me, oh, and by the way, even though I knew like most of my friends had second passports, American passports, British passports, they were leaving. I still thought in my head, you know, I would get to 
finish high school, like my sister, I would bunk off for a year because they wouldn't find a university for me to go to. I'd be given a car to drive. And then maybe I'd go to this. I had this dream university I wanted to go to because years ago we saw these, the older kids go to school. You know, mom, dad would give you a car. They put you in the dorm. You come back home every couple of weeks for food. Uh, and then you'll get this job working for an internship company in the summer and life was great. And it was like suddenly the entire dream that I had crafted in my head as a child, somebody's telling me, wipe the slate off and we're going somewhere else. And because I never dreamed of leaving Nigeria, I didn't have a dream to replace the dream I created as a child. And so for me, it was like a loss. I, I cried so much and I struggled. I actually struggled settling down into the UK because I didn't want to go. I, did, I really did not want to go. And I understood later on that, yes, I'm here because educationally, this is going to benefit me. My older sister is there. But here I was, nobody. Nobody, no one knew me. No one knew who Egosaraiki was. I could walk down the street and wave at people. Even when my mom would drive me in the car, there'd always be someone who would no notice you and you'd wave and they'd wave, right? And so, look, I grew up with my parents, um, who had left where they came from. So we grew up in a different state from where my parents were from. So we were already removed from our culture growing up. And mm. this concept of growing up and living in a culture that's not your base culture started from a very young age. But my dad was in the oil and energy industry. My mom uh, was a serial entrepreneur. We were not rich by any means, but we were not poor by any means. We were taken care of and provided for, but we were not overly provided for. I don't think we were overly entitled by any means necessary. My dad was probably a mid-level manager now that I understand where he was and what he did. Mm. We were happy. We were very happy. Um, and you know, obviously my parents, you know, had their life struggles and family struggles and relationship struggles. We can get into all the African issues. Yeah. But I made sure that they created this environment where to the best of their ability and to the best of the tools they had and what they knew, we had a well-rounded life. So that was me growing up in Nigeria. Very, very satisfied child. Very this satisfied. Is the first. Okay. <laughs> this is really? a, a concrete person. Someone not being excited of leaving no. the country. No. <laughs> it's in the business case that I wrote like 12 or 13 years ago. It was like a morning for me. I cried. Everybody that has been on this platform, at least unless they didn't did share, everybody right. has been excited. I mean, me, I was crying because I mean, I, I was just like young, but excited that I'm leaving coming no. here. No, <laughs> and, I didn't think there was a life for me. Oh my gosh! Yeah, wow. absolutely, absolutely. Oh wow. Oh, wow. This is yeah. a first. And um, so aside from these tears, which is amazing, I, I love to be shocked. This is why uh, <laughs> I continue to do this because this sh is shocking. Um, I mean, a lot of people will be like, why are you shocked? I mean, everybody's excited. We leave our countries for a reason, for a better life. Like in your case, for school, a lot of kids would have been excited. But then again, you were satisfied with the life that you were provided in Nigeria. And for a lot of people to today, I tell them, if you have a great life in the country where you are, there's no need for you to leave. But you're literally starting from scratch. Like yes. the way you felt like when you get to, to the UK and feeling like this is a foreign land, no one knows you, nobody. Yes. yes. It's... It's how it is. You come and you're starting from scratch. Whether you have a job waiting, you're still starting from scratch, adjusting and integrating yourself. It's a lot. But um, that was really interesting. Thanks for sharing that. I'm I'm really yeah. shocked. Oh. Look, I have to say that I, I don't want to, you know, you know, I don't want to say my age, but decades later, older me realizes that 15-year-old me was looking at life through a 15-year-old lens. I wasn't thinking about it. Particularly what job would I get? What career would I have? I just know that as I, because actually I wrote a poem on the plane, which is published in the business case 
And it was a sad poem about why was I going? I couldn't understand why I was leaving. I was so happy. My identity was so tied to my friends and family. And my life wasn't perfect. My family life wasn't perfect by any means, but it wasn't bad. Now, the point I want to make is, but I was surrounded by other friends who would watch Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and they would mimic American accents. So they would try to dress, you know, like, or copy British accents, or they'll go on holiday, or my dad worked for a big international oil company. And so every few years, you your family could get the chance to be posted to a foreign country. Mm -hmm. uh, so we grew up as children already surrounded by this expatriate lifestyle, where people left to foreign countries and came back to our community. And truly, my family also had the opportunity a few times to go out and come back. Mm -hmm. But none of that exposure made me think, yeah, wow. You know, I had friends who dream about going to the US because they love the NBA and they thought they'd play the NBA when they, they got there. Or I had, you know, my girlfriends who had dreams of going to this foreign country so they could be posh and speak like this. I just didn't have any of those dreams. That's beautiful. I, I just was content. I just thought I'm rocking it here and I could rock it in Nigeria. You know, I, when we, I, I think it's 10, age 10 or 11, there are these exams called the common entrance exams and they help you go from primary school to secondary school. Mm -hmm. uh, I had the highest grade in my, in my school, um, 592 out of 600. I'll never forget yeah. uh, something higher. Wow. And I was the first highest in the state, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and the third highest in Nigeria and so from a young age, I appeared in multiple platforms at state and national level. So it never occurred to me to go and compete in someone else's country to be something. Right, yeah. I just thought, I'm going to stay here and I'm going to compete in my own land and I'm going to be great in my own land, right? Yeah, so my I'm mom's telling me, you to think, represent. Yeah. you're going, I'm like, my, my sister's gone. I'm happy for her that she's gone. She's great. She wants to go. <laughs> what business do I have going? Why? Why am I going? Now, I'm grateful that that happened because I look at my education, my career, my career path. But is that to say that there aren't people who stayed in Nigeria that aren't successful today? That's not true, right? Yeah. Uh, but life is obviously pos posing us different challenges and different benefits, which I won't take away. So I just want to make sure that I don't sound like I didn't understand what the benefits were of leaving Nigeria. I do now as an adult, but as a child, my reasons were very well rooted in some very um solid reasons because my identity me as just as an individual compared to my sister for example my identity was very strong uh and and my dreams were very clear in my head and you're almost asking someone to wipe out and have a blank slate and it's it's easier to hang on to a dream even if it's not going to work than it is to hang on to a blank slate and i think that's the general principle we can talk about later no, it's it's true. Because for me, my biggest driver of leaving, my mom asked me what I wanted to do after high school. I told her I wanted to go to America because my aunt was here. Wow. So even the last year of my high school, I already knew what I was going to do with my life. I'm leaving, going to America. That's it. Some, I never said chat with anybody in school until I finally got my visa. Very few people knew and that that was it. I wanted to come to America. The biggest reason was because my, I didn't have an identity. Uh -huh. So in your case, you had. I yes. did not have an identity because I was under my mom. My mom at the time uh, was doing amazing. She, she was at her peak of her business. She was one of mm. those people that was doing phenomenal. She was supplying wholesalers. She was doing all of that, her business. Everybody who met me was going, that is such and such his daughter. Wow. They, they didn't know my name. They, they, uh, even though they knew my name, they chose to use my mom's name. Now that I, I was very grateful for my mom success and the life that she has built for us but in that I was lost I thought lo for some reason I just felt lost I didn't know where I was going to stand um, and hence when my mom asked what do you want to do I said I want to go to America I didn't know what I was coming to do to America 
I knew yes. I wanted to come and start my life afresh where someone does not know me here. That's it. And I've been here since, but I get it. I get what the, I, I completely get it. Identity. Identity is a real thing. Yeah. 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 It's definitely a real thing. And continuing with that, um, do you mind sharing with us your experience of living and working in different countries and how that has shaped your prof your perspective in terms of on um, the energy and the oil industry that you are in? Yes, absolutely. Look, as I mentioned to you, I grew up in a community um, where we were housed because all our parents worked for this oil company, right? And so the first exposure we got was this concept that people would go and work in foreign countries and, you know, return. So I think somewhere as a child, the message in my head was traveling the world was okay and actually an aspiration. Um, that's one. And you could see the richness of the people who had seen the world and what that experience meant for them and, mm. and their children. The other thing about the energy industry, which as a child, this was in my own little child mind, I told myself, an industry that takes the world from darkness Ooh. and poverty and creates industrialization and innovation is where I want to be. When you think about the number of people still in energy poverty today in Africa and the inability to have access to education, to medical treatment, to roads, to industrialization, manufacturing, it all stems from the fact that they are still living in energy poverty. Nothing starts until there's energy. Yeah. Now, ultimately, we are now talking about climate change, the energy transition, cleaner energy sources. I'm, I'm, I'm all there. I'm all there for it. But where we started from, and my grandma telling me about kerosene lanterns and the number of people who probably died from smoke inhalation or house fires, Mm -hmm. or that you know you couldn't read you, you couldn't read if you want even if you were ambitious and you were intellectually very good you couldn't read schools couldn't run without electricity you can't open a hospital and, and run operations so people would get sick with minor issues and die right um and so as a, as a child i knew i wanted to work in the oil and energy industry there was no question this is not something that anyone ever sat me down and discussed with me or told me it does this inspire you no it, it was it was a done deal in my head um, and so when you ask me about going to different countries, it's an odd thing because for someone who struggled so much with leaving Nigeria, where, as I mentioned to you, identity was always the thing for me yeah. and how difficult each readjustment was, then people like, then why have you done it so many times? <laughs> you know, so, yeah. you're saying you got to the UK, you struggled, you got to the US, you struggled, you got to Belfast, Malaysia. Okay. Asia, Hong Kong. <laughs> and by the way, don't forget, I'm telling you countries where I was given a, a work permit or a visa in, in my passport. Yes. I'm telling you countries where I managed a business and spent significant time in that country. Singapore, okay. for example, or China or Thailand. Um, I, I'm just telling you countries where maybe because I got an Asia pack role, I chose to live in Malaysia, but I ran these seven countries in Asia. So there was a lot of cultures and languages and countries which I was crossing. So there was a general curiosity for sure about the world. And there still is. I think I'm just curious about anything and everything. Mm. Um, I'm someone who just likes to seek information. And I'm just curious about people. I'm curious about the world. And so that's always driven it. But for someone who's so deeply rooted in, in what my sense of identity is, it's almost counterintuitive to move so often at the same time. Um, but then again, remember, I have a passion for what I do, right? I have a passion for the oil and energy industry and what, what it does for humanity and humanization and society in general. And so, um, and when I say adjusting, I'm not saying like, oh, I got there and, oh, I, 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 I couldn't thrive. No, I would get there and realize either my jokes aren't funny. It's taken a long time to make friends. And as you get into your 20s and 30s, who are you going to date? Because the people that will naturally be attracted to you or 
see you as beautiful or see you as a choice partner. You are suddenly in a culture where you are different and you may not automatically be seen as a choice partner. And so, you know, your, your personal circumstances shift so much in each of these cultures. When I go to Asia, I would always come back to London to shop because I'm so tall. And Zara, in wow. those days, did not make any clothes in my size. It sounds crazy, but these are real things. So when I talk about the adjustment journey, I'm not saying that I couldn't adjust me because I'm curious and I want to see the world. I love my career and I believe that the more I go work in different environments, different businesses, the better I am as a business leader and as someone contributing to innovation and technology. But I'm just giving you snippets of, of you know, when I got to the US, I am yeah. an engineer and I have to explain myself technically. And for the first few months, I couldn't explain technical concepts because the way that they would explain math is very different from the way that we were taught math in the UK, for example, right? The way that I would express a very technical <laughs> very, very technical issue. And so this was beyond the colloquial. This is beyond my first trip to Walmart, calling my sister at midnight in tears because I wanted to buy cereal. And at that time in the UK, shops still closed on a Sunday. We still had four TV stations. Um, we had dialing internet, you know, broad you know, ways. And I get to the, I get to the US. And I'm standing in a Walmart in Houston and I'm crying because I'm hungry and it's two weeks and I've lost a lot of weight because I don't know what to eat because I go to the shop and I've never seen so many versions of cereal. And then I think I'll buy baked beans. I'll just buy baked beans. Okay. Baked beans is just baked beans. It's safe. That's baked beans with pork. There's baked beans in, in, in brine, baked beans in sugar, yeah. no sugar, baked beans, fat free with fat. And there's a row of baked beans. Uh, what is going on? So when I talk about adjustment, th these are the comical things I'm talking about. It's yeah. not I'm going to take my suitcase and move to another country, right? Yeah. It's who's going to be my friend. It's I used to go for spin class and I had my four girlfriends who come for me and I've landed a foreign country and I don't know how am I going to start making friends so I don't seem creepy. And you start with work, right? You start with work, but then you get to the US and Everybody who's 22 is married, in, they're married and they're married in church. You think, okay, so now no one can hang out with me because all the Texans are married. And I seem creepy trying to make friends with married people from work. And so you think, well, then where do I go to make friends? <laughs> so, so this is the entire point about how to settle down, except for what happens on the business side, right? And how this then informs and feeds what happens with your career and how do you sort of, accomplishment doesn't equate promotion so to speak we all know that accomplishment could just mean you're making an impact and making a difference but I think somehow we equate if you're given a task over excelling and succeeding at that task is an accomplishment in itself or a sense of self-satisfaction how do you get that now that you're a foreigner and you're adjusting and how long does it take to not feel like a stranger anymore in this new culture I can go on and on and on about these things. <laughs> and I still only buy one baked beans. I have not ventured into all the other baked beans or the multiple versions of toothpaste or cereal, which I saw in the US. No, after seven years in the US, I still couldn't figure out what to buy in Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> you know, being in the US for so long, I find it normal now that we have multiple versions of baked beans, multiple versions of cereal. Everything mm -hmm. is multiple. Like, it's so much choices that when you're mentioning it now, I'm like, this is crazy. It's really crazy. crazy. It's yeah. Crazy. Like, I think we shouldn't have this much Malaysia. choice. And I couldn't buy shoes. For the year and a half I lived there, I never bought a pair of shoes in Malaysia. I would have to fly through Singapore because I also managed Singapore. And we had one of our biggest businesses, Singapore, and the other portfolio was in Dubai. And it's only when I flew through the airport, there was one store that had a size 41, you know, US 8 shoes. And this doesn't even sound like a big number when I tell it to you, right? Yeah, and, no, because I'm a 41 or so. So I would not, uh, I'm the same as you then. I would, I, would not... I don't want to go I'm sure they probably sell size 48, 41 shoes now and size 8 shoes. But I'm talking sort of very, you know, many, many years ago, not to give my age away. Um, yeah. And, and I remember being at Zara, the girl goes, this is large. And I'm looking at this thing and I'm thinking, I'm not that big. 
you know, to come past my leg. Wow. Hmm. How do you see yourself beautiful in a culture when everyone is inches shorter than you? You can't find clothes to buy. Do, and let's say you're not married at that point and you're not dating. Do you feel no. beautiful? Do you feel sexy? And all this is affecting how you're going to work, right? Because now you have to also achieve at work. But if I talk about the work side, you have to motivate and lead people who are inspired by very different metrics. They have very different cultural norms. They have very different cultural rules. And someone has said to you, you're the VP of the region, go run it. So first you have to understand how to communicate with these people, how to get across to them. And it's not because anything is wrong with their cultures because you're just coming from a different culture. And somehow you have to assimilate and connect. Human beings are all about connection. You don't make an impact till you connect. Wow. Talking about leadership, I I mean, as you are talking, so many questions are coming up. Um, like, honestly, even, like, we laugh about the cereal, we laugh about the clothing and all of that. <laughs> but it's, it's so serious when you are going through it. And Kidding. those are the things that we are actually even forgetting when we are talking about our stories. And I'm glad that you are highlighting all of those things. Because for me, it took me, I, I was so happy that I brought my clothes that I had bought uh, when I had traveled to South Africa. Because I couldn't fit some of the clothing that they were selling or I just, it just didn't, was not my style. So yeah. I was so grateful for a long time. I was like, oh my God, I'm so glad I brought my clothes. Because... Again, my mentality is, oh, I'm going to go buy clothes when I go to America, not knowing that they have a whole different style here. They 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 have the Timberlands. They have all of, at least in those days when I came, people are wearing sneakers. I'm like, I never wore sneakers at home. Sneakers are for running. Why are you wearing sneakers? <laughs> ah, yeah, people are wearing sneakers. <laughs> canvas, not even sneakers. Forget the word sneakers. It's canvas. <laughs> yes, they're canvases. And you go into the store, people are not dressed up. And I looked weird all the time. So I completely I get it. Like I would go to shopping, I'm dressed up, everything. And people even used to say, you're always dressed up. I'm like, yeah, but it's how, <laughs> <laughs> how I was raised. And then you're trying to adjust to this culture where people just wear anyhow. They just yeah. go to the store looking anyhow and you're like, eh. People here don't bathe or something, but <laughs> it's just, it's very different when you're going to these countries, but I'm glad, I'm so happy that you are highlighting all of those um, adjustments that we have to go through. But talking about leadership, I want to get into it. Um, you are a leader in this industry. What are some of the key challenges that you are you see that you should be driving or people should be concerned about or we should be concerned about and also the accessibility of energy in Africa. We're both Africans. I just would love to know what's happening. I can't tell you how many countries don't even have energy. I'm sure you are aware. Absolutely. How many people are still in energy poverty indeed? It's a very good question you ask about leadership and what are the challenges um, because first of all, for someone to perceive you as a leader, unless you start your own company, if you work for a company, someone has to say, I perceive Nancy as talent. I perceive Nancy as capable and competent and effective, and therefore she's a leader and we will establish her as a leader. So your first challenge is how to connect, how to communicate this so-called talent that you have in this whole new context that you're in. Yeah, And it's the same thing in the oil and energy industry. The end industry spent a lot of time trying to invest and encourage women to join. And then we go through this phase of trying to encourage women to stay in the industry. And then we got past that. And the industry spent a lot of energy trying to convince women to stay in technical roles not to switch into non-technical roles because retention at one point was no longer the issue, so to speak. The issue was making sure we kept women who stayed in technical roles so that they could be in the running for the leadership roles of the company, right? They could make it to whatever they thought was the top for them. But let's just say if the top of the company is a C-suite and the board, are yeah. we making sure that there are enough women in the pipeline? 
But you see that, you know, you're talking about rigorous jobs, in some cases, a very extensive relocations to some very challenging countries, very extensive placements in some very challenging jobs that were male dominated. And, you know, we know the challenges that come from, you know, the very early 2000s where, you know, people just campaigned for making sure that we talked about biases and we made sure that we understood that women could just be as competent in these, these technical roles as men. Um, you know, there's, I, I'm not so sure if it, it came across in the TED talk or it was, it was in a subsequent talk after that uh, about women in business. And you ask, you know, about, again, leadership challenges in the industry. And I was saying, you know, if a room is full of men and you want to sit at the table, someone is going to have to stand up from that table and unlock the door to let you walk in. Someone is going to have to say, guys, I've invited a Gosa to the party. When You know, when you go to someone's house for a party, yeah. people say, Nancy is coming. And when you press the bell, someone has to open the door because yeah. the door is not left open. And that's the challenge. The door is not left open. And so you have to figure out if you want to overcome this issue that there are not enough women in leadership roles in energy companies. Even till today, I think we got to a point where the numbers increased. And unfortunately, for, for many reasons, which we can discuss, those numbers have now dwindled again. Okay, there were some good initiatives which are now being undone. And so mm -hmm. we're almost back to, you know, a decade, two decades ago. And this time we're actually unashamed of it because it seemed like in the past we were ashamed that there weren't a lot of women at the top. And now we're almost unashamed as we become, you know, either very leftist or rightist and, and people become very passionate about their religious and political positions. Um, ultimately, you can't go away from making sure you understand how to find a mentor or someone who believes in you and supports you. And if that boardroom is full of men, one man is going to have to speak on your behalf and let you in. If the boardroom is full of women and vice versa, you're a man or a person of a different identification and you want to get in, there is an unspoken reason why there is nobody else but only women, or nobody else but only men. Mm -hmm. And again, you're going to need an advocate in any other reverse situation to say, oh. guys, let's challenge ourselves. Maybe a different point of view would be good here. A different voice would be good. Now we can take that and talk about nationality. We can take that and talk about citizenship. We can take and talk about immigrants. Because if you're in the US and they've never had a foreigner leave the, com the company, why you? Why should you be given the opportunity? And here you are probably, you talk different, you sound different. And even if after a while you assimilate and you, you sound and pass almost like someone who's been there, yeah. you always have something that makes you sound and look different. And that's why I made the comment around, you know, we like to say where you're originally from, because we're always trying to figure out if you are of this thing. Even after you go to your swearing in citizenship, people still say where you're originally from. Yeah. But you're American now. You feel American. You believe you're American. Where are you originally from, right? And so if, if people haven't done a different thing or haven't embraced different, then you find that you feel as if you are facing challenges. And it's not because anyone has anything against you, so to speak. But I think history has shown us that, you know, we have lots of isms that we still have to overcome as people. And you are in the will of one ism that you are now trying to solve while trying to climb through this, this industry. Um, so I would say my identification would be as a black African woman, that's every minority box I can tick. There have been challenges and there still are challenges, absolutely. You almost want to neutralize so that people see you for talent as talent and want you in the room because you are talented and you have something to offer, not because you're a woman or you're black or African. That then just becomes the extra. 
because yeah. now those perspectives enrich and strengthen what you bring to the table as far as diverse thought and a diverse way of approaching the problem. But more specifically, if you have lived and worked in multiple cultures, you are now this beautiful thing to have in the room. Because if we're talking about a product launch or we're talking about innovation and technology without you even realizing your brain figures out how this will work in Asia Pack, in Russia Caspian, in Europe, in Africa, and you are in the boardroom and you are a contributor shifting and changing things. I love it. Love it, love it. Um, wow. Talking about innovation, the innovation space, and uh, um, how can that be, how can you contribute to the sustainable development in Africa? Because as we are talking, you're saying there's a lot of countries that have no energy uh, for reasons that only governments understand and why and what, why it continues to happen. Uh, what are some of the things that can be done in terms of energy in Africa? Indeed, I'm not a politician, um, but no. I, I, no. I was I was not politic. But look, I think I think every country has an energy source, but there are still people in countries in energy poverty, without access to consistent, sustainable, you know, um, energy that then allows them to industrialize and effectively to live in you know what we consider more modern standards. Where is Africa today as far as energy is concerned? There's, look, investment is obviously required, right? Um, I think accountability is required. Um, accountability to ensure that, is huge. Yeah, accountability is a huge one for us because we're talking about a continent that's rich in natural resources. Hello? Let the church yes. say right yeah we exporting those resources to be processed for us to buy the refined product as a continent we could net balance that continent and so i don't think it's because we lack innovation or we lack talent or we lack the people i think we just need accountability on ensuring that we believe this is a necessary thing that needs to be done for all of africa and we don't need other people to come save the continent. I agree. We don't I, need I international organizations and foreign companies to come save the continent. I agree. Well, I, for I, many I agree. reasons, which are too complex to get into, when you look at the debt load on some African countries, when you look at, you know, the history of colonialism you look at the history of industrialization we are now carrying layers and layers of complex issues that impact what sounds like a very simple solution just give everybody power just mm -hmm. give everybody power. it's now this politically complex thing to solve even though it's necessary and i think we should look at it as a human problem it's a human problem if you know, young people don't have access to education because access to energy is challenging. It's, it's, it's an issue if people are not able to receive medical treatment or there's no access to roads or entrepreneurs with very good ideas are not able to develop and grow their businesses or innovation is not thriving as much. We should have a Silicon Valley in, in Africa. We should have multiple Silicon Valleys. And I know that there are lots of emerging hubs that are doing extremely well, and I'm very proud of those hubs. Yeah. But think about how much further we would be and how much impact we're making on the world. Now, you asked me a question around sustainability, climate change, renewable energy, energy transition. I believe it's absolutely needed because where you have very developed economies that their energy consumption and the output of that energy consumption is impacting the climate and causing climate change and impacting future generations to come. We have no other option but to change, okay? Um, but I always say when people ask me this question, what business do people who don't even have energy to begin with 
have been tasked with the very expensive journey of going into energy transition when they don't even have energy to begin with. Should we not have different solutions for different people? Or is there the opportunity than solving this with traditional energy resources to leapfrog those societies to cleaner energy solutions and renewable energy solutions? And which one is it? And should it not just be that each, each solution is designed vis-a-vis -vis the cause and the reason and the current situation of that, of that country? that group of people, that economy. And everybody should not be held to the same standard. Wow. I love it. No, interesting. All you leaders hearing, please. You could pass in the comments and let us know. <laughs> <laughs> not, not absolutely correct. It's just one point of view and some yeah. reflection. Yeah. yeah. No, they're great questions. Okay. Um, really interesting questions. Uh, hopefully our leaders are able to answer those questions. Uh, but going to next to what you actually do as well, uh, can you tell us about your involvement in CME, which is a really interesting organization? and the Boardroom Africa. Uh, what is your involvement in the women's leadership? I mean, this is my passion. This is my passion project. So See Me actually is an evolution of something I started many years ago, which was called Africa Women Executives in Energy. And the idea was, you know, I was passionate about supporting more women to get to the C-suite within the oil and energy industry. And then as the years evolved, I realized, hold on a second, Women everywhere need help. It's not only in the oil and, oil and energy industry, and it's not only women who are, and the definition at the time were either in Africa or working for companies that have a, had a contribution into the African economy. So you could be in the US, for example, but working for an international orga organization that had an African nexus. And so that evolved into CME, and CME's mission is to support ambitious women, their full potential, whether in industry or in business, to ensure that they get the right support and mentoring to effectively get there, right? And when we say achieve their full potential, you could decide your full potential is senior level management. It doesn't have to be C-suite. You can decide that it is C-suite. You can decide you want to make it to a board role. And so we really want to be inclusive. And why is the name See Me? Because if I look at my career, at every point when I wanted someone to recognize what I was able to offer, I just wanted to be seen. I still want to be seen because I still have ambitions. And so it's effectively, can you see me? Because when you go to your boss saying, I think I, I want that role, I want that opportunity, you're saying, can you see me? Do you see me? Do you see me enough to give me the chance? Do you see me enough to invest in me? Do you see me enough to promote me? Do you see me enough to give me the opportunity and to mentor me and to groom me? Do you see me enough to open the door and give me a seat at the table and give me a chance to contribute? And so that's why it's called See Me. Can you see me? Yes, Nancy, I can see you. I can really see you. And so see me is effectively that it's bringing mentors together and effectively creating a membership platform where people can join and have access to this very talented pool of people and to reach out to them either on a one-off basis for advice or coaching session or on a more systematically designed mentoring relationship where you want to solve a long-term issue or long-term problem, either soft skills, hard skills, or you want situational coaching on how to negotiate your contract, right? And the challenges, of course, that women face, everything from gender pay gap to having access to opportunities to having representation. If no other woman has been CEO, maybe that company doesn't want to give a woman the chance to be CEO. It's just an untested territory that they don't know how to, to, to navigate. You are going on your first maternity leave and worried about what happens when you come back, for example. You know, you... 
have been moved around so many times and now you want to talk about whether or not you want to collect your eggs and should your company pay or not pay or <laughs> I mean all these complex issues right uh, and you want to talk to someone about it or long term you want to say over the next year I want to go from point A to point B as a business owner you know I want to start my own company and I want to raise investment um, how do I become investable? How do I find access to investors as a woman who's gone into business rather than someone who's competing in industry? And the Boardroom Africa was started many years ago by a dear friend of mine, and I was on the board. And now I'm not on the board officially, but I'm still a champion of the organization. And their mission is also very simple. It's to get women, more women into board positions. Um, again, because as the statistics show, I said for what's happening in industry, even in boards, there are not enough women to be able to create the diverse pool of thought um, to ensure that companies are making, you know, the most optimum decision financially and otherwise that they could be making than if they just had a room of men, for example. And so the Board of Africa was started for um companies, board listed, um, public listed companies or companies with boards in Africa and to help more women get access to training, um, board coaching programs. They have a curriculum which you can complete. And then they obviously connected with recruiters to put those profiles forward, to help them interview and compete to get on boards. And when they are on boards, to ensure that they have access to coaching to, to be successful while sitting in those roles. Because I'm a champion of, of talking about promotion and access, but I'm also a very, very big advocate for succeeding once you're there. There's no point getting there and flaming out. There's, yeah. just, there's just no, because if you flame out, the next person isn't going to be let in the room. They'll say, you know, we gave such and such a chance and that didn't quite work out. Okay. And so you want to make sure that you're supporting people to remain and to succeed. Um, and so See Me is effectively an organization which I started relaunching from a first um, first organization which I launched some years ago but unfortunately when you do executive roles for for big companies usually your contract will say something like you will do nothing but this job <laughs> and so over the years I've had to keep this project to the side and it was only finally in one of my executive roles when I was made the CEO for Africa and Asia PAC for a big company where I managed to convince my boss that one year into doing that CEO role, as long as they felt that, you know, I could do the job without um, any issues, I would be allowed to restart my engagement on external projects. And that's actually, in fact, how I came off the board of Africa and stopped oil and energy. But I'm fortunate today that, uh, you know, about a year and a half ago, I started my own oil and energy company in commodity trading space. And, you know, continue to pray for, for growth and success. It's not been easy by any means necessary. And so as we continue to grow and expand with the freedom of my own time and independence of my time, I've relaunched See Me because, you know, I, I don't have a contract that I've signed that says I will do nothing but work for this company. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'm all for See Me. Um... I've said this here time and time and again that all of us want to be seen. We all want approval. We all want uh, that stamp from either our boss, our our mentors, our you know partners. Everybody, everybody wants to be seen. And see me is really powerful. I love it. Um, and uh, you being the leader of um this platform it's really amazing uh there's so much to learn from you you've already shared so much with us uh, but how do you balance all of this i don't sleep <laughs> <laughs> yeah like it's i mean i know that you are no, my like, I, I do sleep i, I do sleep yeah. actually i mean people I, 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 <laughs> I know you are a, mass, a balancing professional, personal life, because I'm sure you have time for yourself and then being a mother and just having time for anything. How do you balance this? I do things in seasons. I actually sleep, you know, uh, quite long hours. I do things in seasons and I 
I was saying to someone, I don't think I have formal, so to speak. Um, and so because I'm not driven by formal, I'm I don't I don't fill up my time with too many competing things. I, I don't try to, you know, start a company, run see me, and then be out on the social scene. It, it, it's just not possible. Mm -hmm. I'm at peace. I'm not on the social scene. Um, and yeah. so then my time doesn't feel pressured because I've chosen the things I think I will spend my time on. But I also let seasons come and go. Um, to the point that even I sometimes forget things I've done. We were outside today. And my my six year old is taking rollerblading lessons because we ski every year, and I'm passionate about taking them out to ski. Oh, very. And um, I was standing there, and I said to the the rollerblade coach, I said, "You know, I actually forgot that in my twenties when I moved to the U.S. as again as part of identity and making friends and mm -hmm. connecting with people, I joined." Um, a rollerblading group Oh wow! because I would go to the park and I saw these people rollerblading. So I made friends with this lady and it became such a serious thing that I actually started racing marathons on inline skates. And I would, you know, you, when you see the people bent over in the Olympics in those leotards, yeah. Yeah. molded, I actually did that for a couple of years. And I don't remember that phase. But it was the season that I threw myself into. I thrived at that season. I enjoyed it. It, you know, gave me a sense of self discipline. It's one more thing in my toolbox. And when the season ended, I took my things. Well, actually, what happened? It's not like it ended. I moved to to Asia, and I realized I, you know, I was I was I was I was running Asia Pacific and the Middle East. And after holding on to all my gear for a few years, I thought. I'm not going to do this again. You know, I'd gotten into marathons at that time. I was now racing Ironman triathlons. I was just at peace that that season had ended and I was in a new season. So I moved on. And so when you ask me about how do I do it, there are two lessons. One, I'm happy with seasons coming and going. Mm -hmm. And two, I select what I'm going to do in that season. And I then don't obsess about everything else that I'm not doing. Because I think when you feel like your time is pressured is because you are worried about and trying to do everything at the same time. That That's never been something that's ever been my issue. And so now when you read my resume, it sounds like I've done so much. It's just because I'm able to, in this compartment, I'll do this and I'll do that and I'll do that. When you try and do everything at the same time, when you look back over a period of years, you probably don't get to do that many things because in the end, too many things you don't accomplish. Uh, nothing really ever stands out. And so those are my two, go those are my two tricks that I can share if it will help anyone. No, that's already helping me because I, for the longest, I've had a hard time of letting go. I have an attachment issue. So... <laughs> <laughs> for a long time it's this is when after a lot of therapy and just letting go I've learned to let go and understand seasons and what you are saying resonates with me so much because I'm like I have to let seasons go and it was through so much learning as to you don't have to hold on to this like you've achieved this okay let it go now <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah, but that's that's beautiful yes definitely um it resonates with me and i'm sure it will resonate with a lot of people uh going season by season understanding that seasons come and go it's um it's the way if i may add one more thing nancy i think the pain of of, of moving so many times also shapes you in a very different way mm -hmm. i i resisted my moves i i went through a lot of pain in some of my relocations <laughs> in yeah. some of my my job changes I think what am I doing here you know they're definitely not going to like me what am I going to contribute here but when you pass through the pain the growth comes yes when you pass through the humility and you even sometimes let yourself fail and fall down and then get back up again it sounds so easy now to say go through season let, let things come and go but it maybe comes from a place of a place of having passed through pain multiple times that I understand, and I remember being in the U.S. thinking, okay, this is not going to last forever. So what am I going to do with this time? Because when I got to Belfast, when I landed, the taxi driver who picked me up said, I don't mean to be offensive, but you're the first colored person I've seen. And he said, is colored even the right word or do we say black now? He even asked me, and this was in 
2003. Um, and I didn't come across any black people for the first year that I was in Northern Ireland. I'm sure Northern Ireland has changed a lot. I hear it has changed a lot. Um, but I went there when, you know, there were still bombs and you know, IRA was still fighting and things were still going on. So I've always been one person who's not afraid of challenge, but it was hard and it was painful. But I remember getting to the US thinking, you mean that pain ended? And I was taking inventory. I said, what did I do with the time? Did I use it well? Or did I spend all the time obsessing about what am I doing here? Why am I here? And so I decided from now on, in whatever phase I find myself, even if it's not ideal, I'm just going to try and figure out how to make something of it. Because one thing I know for sure, it is going to end. At some point, it is going to end. And you're just going to have to figure out what you use that time to do. And the whole concept of, look, when you grow up in Nigeria, as I said, we didn't grow up in excess. And so we did have friends who were more wealthy, had a lot more excess than us. Mm. But because we're happy, I never had this feeling like I was missing something. Um, and we went to the same school as some of these friends, you know, um, my mom would always, you know, say like, you know, all fingers are equal. She'll hold up her hands and she'll say, you know, her mother would tell her all fingers are equal, but they're all useful. They're all useful. And so from a very young age, she'll tell us this. And so inherently, I've just never been bothered by someone has something, I don't have it. Just it's not something that triggers me um, at all. And so as a result of that, I'm able to say, okay, find myself here. I can do these things. I can't do those things. And that's fine. And maybe one day those things may come or they may not come, but something else will come and I'll just be happy with it. But I don't want to sound overly simplistic as if it's come from an easy place. It's also come from, from pain. It's come from resistance to change and then accepting the change painfully. <laughs> it's, come from, it's come from a lot of vulnerability, reaching out to people saying, I think I failed. I think I've done that wrong. I think I didn't get that right. Mm. Uh, sometimes taking inventory, being willing to take you know some, some stock and, and some self-awareness, which can be painful, which can be painful. Mm -hmm. And you go, damn, I wasted that opportunity. I, I spent my three years there crying, sitting inside the house when I could have probably taken some cheap road trips to go see Ireland and drive around the coast and take some pictures. And yeah. then you know what, I'm not repeating this again. I'm, I'm just not repeating this again. I'm going to try harder next time. And when you try and you throw yourself into experiences, they shape you. Yeah, introspective is the best. Uh... Yeah, absolutely. So my two lessons come from, I would say, a place of real growth. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, no, beautiful. Beautiful. I, I can resonate with so many things that you've just mentioned in there. Um, but you, my dear, uh, I'm going to go back to the energy space again. What do you see is the future of the oil and energy space? Okay, so... I, I have I have my, my personal thoughts on this. Mm -hmm. um, we're definitely in a transition phase, okay? We all accept that climate change is real. We can see the effects of it, right? Yes. Uh, we all accept that something different has to be done. But I'm still an advocate that we're all not at the same place in the world. We are all not industrialized to the same level. And so while we are working on cleaner energy solutions and we're working on replacing the more traditional energy resources, not every solution is yet able to achieve energy provision at scale. Not every solution in this current context as of 2024 is financially viable or generates the same level of returns. And not every solution is yet financeable. So mm -hmm. there's still some work to be done on the return on investment versus the cost of innovation versus effectively uh, investments and, and getting uh, support. But that doesn't take away the fact that it needs to be done. And, you know, we need to keep supporting uh, co companies and people who are driving innovation. But at the same time, while we're in this very transitionary phase and we've come a long way, the traditional energy resources are still accessible have become economically viable as far as where we are and how we are designed financially as a capitalist world. 
and still effectively drive if we don't want to go into energy poverty by making the leap too soon, it still drives the movement of all these societies. But then if a society is very advanced saying we're going to make a sudden change and everyone needs to go to solar or go to battery operated battery storage systems or wind or geothermal, or we need to move to biofuels or electric vehicle transportation, then what happens to people who are not at that same level? Like I always tell people, okay, well, yeah, let's send electric vehicles to Africa. Where are you going to charge them? We're going to charge them. <laughs> you see the point I'm making, right? Yeah. So I think I think while, while we need to figure out how we make it investable and affordable, repeatable and at scale, we're still trying to figure out how to transition out of what is an expansive amount of res resources, natural mm -hmm. resources, you know, that are still um, in Africa, not completely tapped. Yeah. And and this where the whole commodity trading world comes in. And that's where, you know, the company I've, I've launched goes, comes into the oil and energy industry space, oil and, oil and gas space is you still have the footprint of natural resources and who has it and who needs it. And commodity trading companies are still in the business of helping to supply and demand this differential, who has, who needs. Mm -hmm. Now here we talk about electric vehicles, but you do realize that all these batteries are running on metals that need to be mined. Yes. Mining sector runs on traditional energy resources. So not every clean, clean technology is really clean, but then all we're saying is it's a reduction of the, re, the use of, of, of traditional energy resources. And so we almost have to accept that we are effectively changing the balance of traditional to cleaner because it's right for the climate, it's right for the future, sure. but it needs to be done in a way that is sustainable it's at scale, it's accessible by everyone, it's affordable by everyone, and it doesn't put anybody in a deficit as far as the ability to move their society forward and have access to energy. That, that energy drives industrialization and it drives you know, the movement of, of the society. So for Africa, it has to be a case-by-case -case situation. You know, We can't say we're going to set a goal by 2030 that all cars are EV. Yeah, but they don't have power. They're not on the grid. So <laughs> they're going to charge the cars, right? So uh, the point being that it's it's a case by case solution, but it's a solution that is necessary, and you almost have to allow everybody have a transitionary business plan for how each of us will get there. And isn't it the case that rather than setting one rule for everyone, that we say, look, if we all contribute to a net reduction of X amount then we've saved the planet. If we all contribute to a net reduction of <clears throat> a net percentage, we have curbed climate change or started to reverse it. And shouldn't we then all be given different metrics? It's like, if you have children, you're not going to hold them all accountable to the same standards. Yeah, You're going to say, hey, you use more, you pollute more, therefore this is your target. And you use less, you are in energy poverty, um, you don't have the funds. And so this is your goal and this is your transition journey. It's 10 years, not five for this guy or that person or this place. And so that's what I would love to see more and more. But I love the conversations I'm seeing. I love the innovation and technology drivers that I'm seeing across all the different sectors. And now we add in technology, artificial intelligence, digitization, it's just becoming more, for someone who's an engineer who started off in R&D, this is my geek world. <laughs> I just thrive. <laughs> I just thrive seeing all of this happen. Um, yeah. Listen, I'm so proud of your work that you've been able to accomplish and to be able to share just a little bit of that with us here. And um, truly, thank you for daring to make a mark on this planet. And you have done a phenomenal job in being a leader and in setting that example for all of us. I'm so proud. Thank I'm you. so proud and I'm so honored to have you here. Um, last question, how can people join See Me 
that are mentors already in the space or they are leaders, they want to mentor or some people that are looking for mentors, how can they join your space? We are just about to release the updated uh, membership portal and mentor page. It should be out in the next two or three weeks. And it's as simple as clicking the button and putting your profile on there, telling us, you know, what you think you can effectively coach someone else on. And for people who want to become members, we obviously have the free membership opportunity to have access to content, to podcasts, to interviews with mentors who talk about different topics that will be very helpful. And certainly, you know, um, access to paid content that really then drives uh, further solutions and where we create you personalized, um, you know, personalized, a personalized journey for, for mentoring and coaching to really help uh, members. But most importantly, when people join, they join a community and so they can contact each other. You know, you can find out who the next woman is in, in all, and you can meet the next Nancy. Um, so God bless the person who sent you my TED talk because <laughs> we would have never met, right? Yeah. But if we were both see me, we would have met because I would have seen your profile in the member portal. <laughs> so all that's needed is just click on our page when we launch it and sign up to our newsletter, stay in touch with us, keep watching out for what we're doing. If you're someone who you feel that you have something to give back, click on the mentor page and register yourself as the mentor. And we will match you through your calendar availability yeah. with people your voice on, on the mentoring uh, topic or mentoring journey. And yeah, th there is a monetized solution to it. People will be uh, you know, monetized for their time and on the paid content side, members will, will contribute. Because I think when everything is free, people oftentimes don't take it serious. Um, so we do have the unpaid section, but we do have a lot more rigor for when people do pay membership fees, very minimal, um, mm. because then you feel like you've worked hard when you pay for something, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, listen, I told you about my mentor um, when I first was doing the podcast and doing it behind the scenes before the podcast. I paid for that. Yeah. <laughs> I, paid for, I, I paid for a whole lot more things behind the scenes just to learn and continue. I, I still continue to learn. I still continue to learn. Uh, and I took it more serious because I would attend 12 in yes. the morning. If I missed a the class, they had pre-recorded. I would watch those because I've spent money. And yeah, no, it, it definitely makes sense. A lot of the things that are free, people don't take it very seriously. Uh, they either show up and they'll show up today, tomorrow they don't show up. But once they pay for it, there's that value to it. That they'll, they'll show up. I know it's late where you are. You are our first guest from Dubai. <laughs> yes, joining us from Dubai. I've been to Dubai. <laughs> yes. Listen, I'm traveling the world, okay? Do you have physical <laughs> travel? I am traveling through this podcast. I've been all around. Sydney, Bali, you know, now wow. today in Dubai. So, yes. I am um, so grateful to you for making time. And um, I know you have little ones like myself. So you, my dear, thank you so much. And to all our listeners and our viewers, I'll have everything in the show notes. Again, um, you have all of her contacts. If you like this conversation, make sure you tag her, send her a message and let her know what you've taken away from this conversation. There was so much jams in there and a lot of things to learn. We and, more episodes. <laughs> <laughs> and if there's just some, something that she reminded you of, let her know too. You know, she's reminded me of a lot of my past. So, <laughs> so just let her know. But this was so much fun. So, uh, so many teachable moments. Um, so grateful. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. <laughs>